Welcome, everybody, to the Thursday edition of the Not Your Average Investor Show. Today, we're doing the JWB, Rental Legal Property of the Week. Week, 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 week. Which is a new construction property, only seven miles from Jack's largest Navy base that has 21,000 jobs. Greg, you are a amazing co-host because we are now officially live on Facebook for the Thursday edition of the Not Your Average Investor Show. Today, we profile the JWB, Radio Legal Property of the Week. Wait, 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 wait. I am your host, Pablo Gonzalez. With me, as always, the man that I like to call GC because he's got genius concepts because he generates cash flows, because on some days he's a particularly great co-host, and because his parents named him Greg Cohen. Say hello, GC. Hey, everybody. Great to be with you. Good to, good to be with you, buddy. Thanks for holding it down while I went through tech struggles of the eyebrows. You saw that? Was, you saw that? It's, I'm, I'm beating up right here. I don't, know if, you know, I don't know if you could see the sweat, but it was really on me. And uh, you, know, you went through this. You showed everybody to go to jwbinventory.com to download the property. But... I like to tell everybody that if you're here because you want to know about rental income property investing, you're in the right place. If you want to know about the best types of property management in order to maximize returns for rental property investing, you're in the right place. And if you just want an edge on the Jacksonville market, which we're going to talk about today to get a little edge for real estate professionals, for you and your clients, you're in the right place. Next place to go is chatwithjwb.com. And we are now about to welcome our community to the show. You ready for the roll call, GC? Let's roll. John Hanning, good afternoon. Drew Barnhill, good afternoon. Lydia Filson, good day, y'all. Good day to you, Lydia. Raj Bantu's back in the house. Hello, all. Lee Bishop, hey, I'm on Zoom on my phone, and it's a fine good afternoon. Good for you, Lee. Happy to have you. Shelly Johnson's back from B-Town, little Bradenton, Florida. Dean Curry from Columbus, Ohio, in the house. He's back as well. Chris, there's somebody that, that is logged in as C-Coons, C-C-O-Ns. I know that you've been here before. It's Chris. Is it? Let me know. Let me know where your full name is. <laughs> Sorry's in the house from San Diego back. Stevie B is back in the house. We haven't seen you in a minute, Stevie B. We got Marilyn Cotterman. Hello, all. You know where Marilyn Cotterman is from. She's from home of Salsa, Florida. Home of the manatees. Nadeem Shaw. Howdy, y'all. Happy investing. Howdy, y'all to y'all. Nadim, good to have you. Leslie's in the house from Denver. Good to have you. And uh, that's what we got so far. I love the roll call, man. I really, it really gets my, my blood pumping. I love seeing our, our community just coming back and forth, right? Like just, just showing up again and again, love seeing the new names, love seeing Leslie coming back from Denver. Sorry, you're officially a regular now. Who else, who else is new with Shop and Heal? We got C Cons, who I feel terrible about. Dean, you're D, Dean, you've been around a couple of times. You qualify as a regular. Shelly from B Town definitely qualifies as a regular because she's got a nickname for her hometown. That is that is the telltale. Chris Consaga. That's C Cons. I knew it was Chris. Chris, welcome back, Chris. Happy to have you, bud. And and Leo, good morning from California. We got the family in the house. Those of you that have been here before know that this is an interactive show. And the two ways to interact is what you're doing right now in the chat, chatting with each other. Little trick there. You got to put everyone instead of just host and panelists. So Leslie, you're only talking to us. You're only talking to the host and panelists. If you change, so are you, sorry. If you just change that to everyone, then everybody sees what you're saying. So whenever you come up with a brilliant observation, everybody gets to see it. And the other way to interact in the chat, if you want your question asked on the show, you want GC to answer you directly, please use the Q&A. That's a different function. And the Medge is back. Welcome back, Medge. Good to see you. And, uh, you know, I asked you to use the Q&A because you're going to see the chat's going to move real, real fast. I have a limited brain processing power as I'm trying to dump all this energy into this call and make it fun and, and also learn and keep track of genius concepts over here. So the Q&A stays in front of me. It makes it a higher uh, propensity for me to actually ask this. And <laughs> Nadim puts my first sip of coffee this morning. Nadim, I hope that you enjoy that sip of coffee. That's a, that's a, that's a glorious feeling. And before we get into the actual property this week, we got a, uh, what do we got here? Beep, 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 beep. Breaking news, Greg. You got, you got some news about downtown Jacksonville you want to share with us? I do. I do. There's nothing better than your notification for breaking news, by the way. It's just like, it's, it's, it's the sweet music 
of the Not Your Average Investor Show starts with your, your breaking news. We do have some really cool news to share. And for those who are in the group, this is going to be coming into the group soon, but posting a couple of articles that are really impactful and kind of underscore a lot of the themes that we've been talking about in the show lately, right? We've been talking about population growth, right? Why is population growth important as a rental property investor? It's Population growth is is the underpinning of demand for rental housing, the underpinning of demand for home sales, right? Home people who want to live in homes, buy homes and live in them, which those are incredible profit centers for you, right? We want people wanting to move here so that they can rent homes from us. When you have increased demand there, that tends to bring prices for rent up. Same thing for what we're seeing for home prices overall going up, home sale prices going up as well. Pretty cool breaking news, right? Jacksonville has long been thought of as what we'll call a second tier city, right? In terms of population growth or market overall, right? We're not going to compete with New York, right? Or, or, or these major cities out there, right? Chicago, right? Those are your top tier cities in terms of population. But we've largely been thought of as a second tier city. Well, we're moving up the ranks. So I'm going to put an article into the group here. Jacksonville, according to the latest census, is now the 12th largest city in the country. That is crazy growth for Jacksonville, especially over the last, you know, five, six years. In fact, actually, the, the data shows that 500 new people move to Jacksonville every single week, and that has been happening consistently since 2015. So this is a great thing. Again, for those who are investing in Jacksonville, you know that you're doing this because of you get both sides of the equation. You get positive cash flow, which is important for risk mitigation. That keeps you in the rental property game for the long haul. And you also want above average returns. Well, above average returns happen when you are in a growth market that has population growth that's higher than the national average. And if you sprinkle a little bit of smart debt on there, if you know how to use smart debt and you sprinkle it into your financial plan, that's how you can accomplish some significant return on investment and uh, great to know that people all day, every day are making the decision to move to Jacksonville. Like somebody else I know not too long ago who moved to Jacksonville, Pablo, you know, anybody who moved to Jacksonville not too, not too long ago. Yeah. You know, for me, my move to Jacksonville three years ago was what I like to call a GC, a good call because it has ev everything that you're talking about. I've lived it, right. Like this idea that, and this idea that in a growing population, there is growing opportunity. I, that, I did not foresee that. I, I tell everybody that Jacksonville has over-delivered on everything, um, except maybe restaurants, but it's over-delivered on everything that I, that I expected. I expected to come here and have a lower cost of living and a higher quality of life. My cost of living was lower than I expected. My quality of life is higher than I expected. And what I was worried about was I left behind a really influential, impressive you know, solid network in Miami. And I was, and, and I also was told, you know, economic opportunities up there aren't going to be the same. And that's really where it's over delivered. My, my ability to grow a network here that is parallel and or better than anything that was going on in Miami in a very, very short amount of time is a major, major, very important over deliver for me. And the economic opportunity I've been able to, I came here with a, with a great opportunity that didn't pan out. And in the meantime, not only have I been able to build a very profitable business being here, but my wife, a W2 employee, literally makes almost twice the salary that she was making in Miami. I mean, mm -hmm. that's insane, right? Like she got, she got hired at like 50% more than the salary of making in Miami and her trajectory has gone up. So, so this idea of economic opportunity in a very stable economy is very, very real. And to your point, right? Like that trickles down to stability and trickles down to rents and it trickles down to this other stuff that is great for investors. Absolutely. When you're in a place that people want to be, it's great to hold hard assets, right? That's what housing is in a place like Jacksonville. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fact. And, you know, there's also that is so, so correct me if I'm wrong. That is you're saying that it's the 12th most populous city in the U.S. now. That's right. Yep. So it's been Crazy, like, right? it's been like top three fastest growing. And now it's like, I'm not just like going through growth spurts. Now I'm a big boy. Right. Yeah. It's, it's been sustained this level of new net migration in migration into Jacksonville has been happening for the better part. Well, it's been happening for decades, but this extra increased level of population growth 
the the figure that it referenced 500 people moving a day i mean that's that's an even more advanced and and, and higher level of population growth that's since 2015 that was way before the pandemic. And now the pandemic, of course, is causing people to want to move to cities like Jacksonville that are not as densely populated, have low state income taxes that are not directly correlated with where they may be living. So it's only expanding this. I can't wait to see the, the population growth numbers. You know, we won't see them for a year or two or three or whatever after, you know, post pandemic and the, the census and the government has time to go through the numbers. But everybody knows that the population here has been growing even faster this past year and a half than it was in the previous year and a half. Yeah, those are going to be crazy. And Drew Barnhill puts, he could be moving next. You never know. So I look forward to seeing that number go up by one, Drew. We'd love to have you here, buddy. And uh, that is for overall city population. And I also understand that beep, 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 there's breaking news about just downtown specifically, right, Greg? Yes, absolutely. So the city of downtown has, or the city of Jacksonville and downtown has largely mirrored our growth plan up after other successful downtowns. So it's a very thorough strategic plan. It's built off of modeling what success has been in other cities. Our president, Alex Savakis, is a part of many leadership groups downtown, and he's been on those trips with the city leaders and the mayor and other highly influential people to go to Charlotte, to go to Cincinnati, to go to Nashville, to go to some of these other places where they get to meet and see people and who have accomplished this and really changed their cities and their downtowns. And so when we talk about how important this is for Jacksonville and for all of you as investors in Jacksonville, it's critical because this is a huge opportunity to maximize your returns long-term over the next full market cycle. When you hold assets that are surrounding downtown, like we all do, this is a big opportunity for you. And there's a model to do it. And there's tons of people out there that want to help Jacksonville do the same thing that has happened in other cities. So what they have gleaned from those experiences are some key metrics that are going to signify this growth. And the metric that the entire city in Jacksonville has rallied around in terms of downtown is that we want to get to 10,000 residents living downtown. And when I first started, I, I originally moved to Jacksonville in 2005. I mean, I don't know what the number was in 2005 of people living downtown, but it was probably like 2000, right? And it probably grew to like 3000 up until, I don't know, I'm making some of this up, but right until like three years ago or something, like it was like 3,500. Well, last year we were in the 5,000s and that was a big deal. And I shared that with everybody on the show just recently. I took a look at the number. We have 6,100 residents living downtown. That's an 18% year-over-year increase in, in one year of population growth, just residents living downtown. So this keep, keep Jacksonville accountable to this 10,000 residents number. It's really, really impactful, and we're well on our way. In fact, the number is likely higher. We'll, of course, get the next state of downtown report, which is where this number comes from. But the number of actual residents living in downtown is probably much higher because we've had another 400 plus apartment units come online in downtown just since this report came out. So we're on that trend. We put everybody in Jacksonville, put this goal out there to get to 10,000. We had Daniel Davis who is the pre uh, president and CEO of the Jacksonville Chamber of Commerce on the show about a year ago. And he said, hey, we're going to get there much quicker than what people think. And even Pablo and I were like, wow, I don't even know. I mean, that's, is that possible? And he's, I think he said in a year and a half or two years. Well, it's, it's going down that direction. And that's so critical because when we have people living downtown, more businesses start to invest in downtown. The amenities for people who are living downtown improve. This flywheel of growth improves. And where it lands is higher, higher median incomes for all of Jacksonville. And that attracts new talent. And that's that flywheel that we're trying to get on. So a really cool measurement to pay attention to. And we're at 6,100 as of the last report. And I'm expecting that number to be even higher when the next one comes out. You mentioned Daniel Davis. He's actually coming back on the show next week, right? We're, we're, we're ahead of the teasing it out here, but like, since we're going to bring up his name, I just had a call with him last week. He's ready to come be accountable for the numbers that he said, talk about what's coming up next. He's a pretty cool guy. He's a cool hand, right? Yeah. You want to yeah. talk about somebody who's a mover and shaker in downtown Jacksonville and overall, I mean, Daniel Davis is, is right there. 
Yeah, yeah. Worst kept secret, probably future mayor of Jacksonville is like the worst kept secret of all that stuff, right? And Drew Barnhill says, going to need more downtown residential condo buildings because he couldn't find one newer than 2008. You're right. They're, they're, they're happening. And he also puts, he's seen it all happen in Atlanta. And I agree, man. I saw the same thing happen in Miami, right? Like yeah. just that downtown tips. And all of a sudden you got Whole Foods downtown, you got movie theaters downtown, you got, you got everything, right? Like everything starts happening. I want to welcome Oscar Chavez, who checked in with us. Hello, Oscar. Good to have you, my friend. And now let's do this, man. What we promised. Let's go to the property of the week. Week, 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 week. Give me one second right here. We are going to magically whisk you away to 8238 McLaughlin Street, Jacksonville, Florida, 32210. It's a purchase price, by the way. Let me know in the chat. Is it looking clear? I can zoom in or zoom out, make it easy for everybody. It's, it's a purchase clear, price of 205000 uh, three bedroom, two bathroom, two car garage, estimated lease, lease two to three year lease of $1,275. Rents are going up in Jacksonville, boy. And uh, estimated conventional financing total monthly cash flow. This is what you're coming for here, right? These two numbers, this total monthly cash flow and this total ROI. I'm going to zoom in on him because we're going to dive in real quick right here. Total monthly cash flow of $110, total estimated conventional financing return on investment of 7.38%. I'm seeing it's looking clear in the chat. GC, why don't you clear up for us what this total monthly cash flow number is all about? Absolutely. And for, for all those new folks that are joining the show, if you have any questions about the numbers or the concepts or what we talk about right now, fire those questions in. Many times we get a rush of questions at the end of the show. We might not be able to get to them. So if you're sitting on a question, go ahead and fire that in. We'll make sure that we can get to that. Total monthly cash flow is really important. I think there are two metrics to look at when you're making a decision of, to, of whether or not to buy a rental property for an investment. The first one is, what is my total positive monthly cash flow going to be? And the reason that this is so important is this is your risk mitigation part of your investment. When you're buying a rental property, you want it to be an asset and not a liability. And the simplest and easy, most easy, and the, the way that I internalize assets and liabilities, because I'm not an accountant, right? I'm just a real estate investor, is that an asset is something that pays you every single month. And a liability is something that you pay every single month, right? Your, your cable bill is a liability, right? But a rental property brings in enough rental income that it offsets any expenses that you have, and it's paying you every single month. Pablo, would, would you rather have assets or liabilities? Assets. assets, right? And if you have the ability to use your money to go and acquire more assets, are you going to do that? Yes. Absolutely. The problem is most people out there use their money to go acquire more liabilities. <laughs> We're different right here, right? But uh, the, the reason why positive monthly cash flow is so important is that that is the, the deciding factor, the simplest, easiest deciding factor of whether this is an asset or a liability. Right. And even if we take this even a step farther, many people think their own primary residence is their biggest investment. They think of it as their biggest asset to me. And if you're a, a, a follower of rich dad, poor dad, Robert Kiyosaki, your personal primary residence is not bringing in income for you. It's putting a whole lot of expenses out there, right? It, that is your biggest liability out there. So when we talk about rental properties, completely different. This has the ability to generate rental income. You do have expenses, but that rental income more than offsets the expenses that you have. You're even going to be able to take out debt, like smart debt, really inexpensive debt with incredibly lo low terms and incredibly advantageous terms. And it's still going to cover those debt payments, right? Name some other investment out there where you can take out the debt on that with such smart terms and still be able to cover the debt payments. You're not going to find them. So that's why I love positive monthly cash flow. Now, when you see $100 or $110 or $150 or $75, to me, you just got to make sure that's paying for itself, right? Don't get hung up on, wow, should I go for this deal because it's $5 more here, or $25 more, or $25 less, right? Positive monthly cash flow is make sure you're in the game, that you have a little bit of a buffer, so that you can invest for a full market cycle. And that is, that's how you win. You buy assets that pay for themselves every single month and you hold on for a full market cycle. And that allows you to profit, ma maximize your profits from all five profit centers. 
not just cash flow. There's five of them, but you got to be in the game long enough. Uh, so that's that, what that $110 is. That's the estimated monthly cash flow on a normal month for, for this property, which is JWB property that will be purchased by a JWB client. They're going to put 110 bucks in their month, in their pocket every single month on a normal month. All right. Scalable investment, investing in assets, not liabilities. I think you said most people do this, but we don't do it. I think you meant to say average people do that, but not your average investors scale. True that. True that. True that. True that. So that is, that's us, right? So that's what we're doing out here. Scalable investments pay you every single month. That $110 is just the typical transaction that you're going to have at the end of the month. It's going to comprise the majority of your experience, but there are, as you mentioned, five profit centers, and there are other costs as well that aren't just property management fees and, and your mortgage, right? So why don't you, you know what, before that, because we incentivize questions, right? We love questions here. The sooner you ask them, the faster we're going to get to it. And Raj mm -hmm. Bantu popped in a question early, man. So I want to reward that behavior. Raj Bantu asks, what is water treatment fee on the Excel sheet? Help me find the GC, first of all. Yeah. Yeah, hang hang a Louie. Go to the left there. And what's that? Row 28 there. So yes, it's a great question. You don't always see these types of fees, but if I start with the big picture here as a rental property investor, most people who buy rental properties have unexpected costs that they didn't account for. And or that they were too, they weren't conservative enough with the cost. And what ends up happening is these wonderful spreadsheets that they have going into the property turns into a nightmare because they didn't know how to properly assess the costs. Now, if you're working with a turnkey company out there, like JWB is a vertically integrated company and we sell these properties turnkey, meaning we do everything for you. We put it up there on a silver platter for you. It's got a resident in place. It's rented and property managed and all that good stuff. Even when you work with property management companies, very few of them will actually go to the lengths of detailing costs like water treatment fees, which might be necessary and put that into your return calculations. It's almost unheard of. And the reason is because the more cost they put in there, the lower their return on investment is. And in their opinion, that limits their ability to sell. So they're, they're not financially incentivized to do that. But we know enough about the resident experience and how to win long-term that for certain properties in certain areas, we need to make sure that we have water softeners in our properties, right? And water softeners have fees every single year to make sure that they're properly maintained. And we look at that and if we know that there's going to be a service agreement fee to maintain that wonderful relationship with your residents, so they can have a long experience and wanna stay long-term, we know about that, we're gonna put that into your evaluation. So that's what that water treatment fee is there, $200 a year, that's for the water softener. And we know enough about that area because we stick to the same neighborhoods over and over and over again. Been doing this for 15 years. We know that there's hard water in that area and that it's going to affect the resident relationship. We know enough about that. We put it in, the water softener in, and we build in the actual fee that you're going to incur every single year to maintain it. And then you know about it. It's in your evaluation up front. And then for you as a client, you're not surprised or blindsided when you get the $200 bill every single year. We facilitate the whole thing for you just shows up at a line item. And then we're perfectly positioned to meet our return on investment expectations. There you go, Raj. So not only did GC answer what the actual treatment fee is, also giving you a little bit of insight into one of my favorite parts of the JWB business model, which is the data flywheel that informs all decisions, right? If you read uh, Jim Collins' work, who's kind of like the the godfather of business thinking of this generation. He talks about how all these great businesses that have come out that make these astronomical leaps from good to great, they have this data flywheel that informs everything that they do and that provides a cumulative advantage for their clientele. Like Amazon knows what people are buying more, so they know what to stock more. Like Netflix knows what you're watching, so they know what to make, right? JWB knows what costs are actually happening in all their properties so that they can properly set your expectation for an investment uh, journey, which is a long-term journey here at JWD. I don't think I've ever said that before. What do you think, Greg? How'd, how'd that come out? Good? Smooth, brother. Smooth. Ooh, smooth. All right. So within the water softening, 
right? That is a total cost. Is that in the total monthly cash flow? Are you dividing that by month or is that in this total ROI? And tell me about this total ROI. So the total monthly cash flow is your normal expenses that happen every single month. So that wouldn't be included every single month, right? Your normal expenses every single month are your, you know, your rental income coming in minus your principal, your interest payments, your property taxes, your property insurance costs, and your property management fees. So that's what you're going to see on a normal month. However, those additional costs, one of which being the water softener fees that Raj pointed out there, those are going to be included in that line below that 7.38% estimated total return on investment. Now, let me level with you guys. If you look at an investment and you look at a rental property investment, you are not going to look at that total monthly cash flow of 110 bucks a month and be like, oh man, I got to have that. You're not going to look at it and be like, wow, this $110 a month is going to change my life. I totally get that, right? I saw that exact same thing, right? I saw whatever, 100 bucks a month or 150 bucks a month in potential cash flow in 2006 when I was working for Johnson and Johnson and I saw that but something in me clicked and I was willing to quit my job <laughs> go out on a limb and in, into real estate which I had zero experience in my family had zero experience in and put all of my heart and soul into acquiring a portfolio of rental properties and building a business around it I saw the same $110 that you saw but what I also saw was all of the profit centers, right? So that if you're looking at real estate at rental properties and you're saying, well, geez, why would I do this? It's only 110 bucks a month. You're looking very myopically. You're missing the big picture, right? Most investors miss the big picture. Well, that conventional financing total return on investment, that is getting closer to the big picture. We're not 100% there yet, but it's a step in the right direction. So the total return on investment takes into account some additional profit centers, and some additional costs that come along the way. We'll start with the, the negative item first, the cost, right? Of course, it includes that water softener fee of $200 there. Just, you don't have that in every property, but if your property has that and needs it, it's gonna be there. It also includes maintenance and vacancy costs. They do not happen every single month, but they're going to happen. And we have that great data flywheel of data here at JWB to track over 2,000 properties, many of which are right down the road from this one on McLaughlin, to see exactly what over time their maintenance costs have been, and we project that for you. So it's going to include those things. It's also going to include tenant placement fees, right? And the fees that the property manager is going to earn, JWB is the property manager, we earn that fee whenever we put a new resident in your home. And luckily, we only have to do that on average every four and a half years. Right? That's how we save those fees. But it's, good. it's going to include those tenant placement fees. So it includes that, includes closing costs, includes all the things that will affect your investment over the long haul, but that they don't happen every single month. That's the negative side. On the positive side, it's also going to include tax savings, which are the tax advantages that you get from this asset class. Everybody on this call gets a, this, 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 the, the opportunity to enjoy these extra tax savings from rental properties that you don't get from investments in stocks, bonds, mutual funds. So it's going to include that. It's also going to include your principal pay down. Principal pay down means that as your resident is paying the, your rent to you and you're paying your mortgage payment, there's a portion of that mortgage payment, which is your principal. And every month, like clockwork, your principal payment, payment your principal balance goes down. So it's going to include the positive effects of that. So you, you lump all of that together, all right? Some negatives, some positives, and you divide that by your initial investment. And that's how you get to that roughly 7.38% estimated return on investment. Good rate explanation. And all those costs are, you know, included in these other tabs of the sheet that you can get at jwbinventory.com if you want to dig deeper. Raj Bantu puts in here, I bought two properties from JWB in the last 10 months. I appreciate JWB's transparency because I have other PM property management companies that are not as transparent. Thanks, Raj. That's wonderful to hear. Thank you so much for your trust, Raj. Do you see, let me, you know, that since Raj brings this up of like having other property management companies, I thought you guys were a turnkey investing company, right? Like why is, why is Raj talking about property management companies not being that transparent versus JWB? Oh, brother, this is straight out of our, our, our playbook on our, what was that? That was the Tuesday run, 
right. Pablo and I, are, we're, we run on Tuesdays and Thursdays at like five o'clock in the morning. And you never quite know where the conversation's going to go. But on Tuesday, I, we were just talking and, and I'm like, I'm like, Pablo, I'm like, we're not a property management company. Like we are so much different than a property management company. We're, we're an asset manager, right? We are managing that asset to grow. Like a property manager really is concerned with just keeping your house rented. There are so many ways to keep your house rented and kill your return on investment, <laughs> right? And unfortunately, a lot of property managers solely focus on keeping the house rented and returns go down for their clients. You want to be involved with an asset manager. An asset manager is thinking, okay, in order to win long-term, I need to have a long-term resident there. I know enough about the area and I've built enough homes in that area to understand that there's hard water in that area. I know that this long-term is going to include a $200 water treatment fee if I put in this <laughs> water softener. I know when I go and sell that asset to a client, I want to make sure that I hit those return on investment expectations and beat them so that they come back and fill it out their entire portfolio. And that's how it makes it onto this sheet right there. So if you're not getting that level of transparency, ask yourself whether you're dealing with just a property manager or if you're dealing with an asset manager. Love it. Drew Barnhill liked that. She says, true words, Greg, love complete asset management. Drew Barnhill, who was with us, a couple of weeks ago, talking about property management horror stories and how, you know, this whole experience is different. Thanks, Drew. I appreciate, appreciate your insights. So we figured that out. You've explained total ROI. You've explained the five profit centers, right? I like to, I like to talk about that debt pay down profit center, kind of like what Tim Hicks said a while back of, you know, if all things equal, as long as you got positive cash flow, somebody's paying down a mortgage for you, right? Somebody's paying down a debt for you. I always like that one. But I noticed that you don't include one of the profit centers here in this 7.38. And the reason I know that is because here it says 0% appreciation rate, right? And you always talk about how the Jacksonville market is about appreciation. So why isn't appreciation rate put in here, GC, please? A uh, couple of reasons. I mean, number one, we're comparing this asset against other assets of where you could put your money. And historically, the stock market produces a 7 to 9% return annually. There's tons of ups and downs and all that other stuff, but, you know, you're producing between a 7 to a 9% return in the stock market. No monthly cash flow typically coming from your, your equities, your stock market. If you're in the bond market, your returns are not 7 to 9%, but you get some recurring income, but you're, you're not getting the 7 to 9%. So, it's hard to find an asset with risk mitigation involved, right? Monthly recurring income coming where you can get a seven to 9% return. You can get that in rental properties. You don't even have to bank on home price appreciation to get that. So when I get asked why we don't include that, I look at this versus other places for you to put your money. And I'm like, this one still wins, even if we don't talk about home price appreciation. So I'm not in a rush to just go out and promise the absolute best part of rental property investing over the long haul, which is home price appreciation. Once you have your, your monthly cash flow coming in, home, home price appreciation is going to be the largest, largest driver of your return on investment. But we don't, have to, we don't have to showcase that. The other thing is that in order to actually enjoy home price appreciation, and I know this from investing for 15 years, is that you need to be in for the long haul. If you are going into this decision, hoping that you're going to see a certain amount of appreciation after two years, three years, five years, it doesn't work that way. I know enough about that because that's what I thought in 2006 as I was buying 40 rental properties and I was a young guy who had a lot of debt, expecting that the market was going to go up over the next three years or five years and ask me how that turned out, <laughs> right? It didn't go well because the market crashed. Of course, I had positive monthly cash flow for risk mitigation, which kept me in the game. Now I still have those properties today. And when you hold on for a full market cycle, a full cycle, 10 to 20 years, that's when you can actually bank on your historically accurate home price appreciation levels happening, right? Even from 2001 to 2021, people aren't aware of this, but in that 20 year cycle where we had the biggest run up, the biggest crash we'll probably ever see and a subsequent run up, we still are tracking 4.3% average annualized appreciation year over year. 
from 2001 to 2021. That 4.3% is the exact same average annualized appreciation historically coming from the Federal Housing Finance Agency for Jacksonville. So over a cycle, you're going to find that Jacksonville's home price appreciation rate because of population growth and other dynamics is going to be right around 4%, maybe higher. And you just can't do it if you invest for the short, short run. So I don't know if you're going to listen to me. I don't know if you're going to follow my advice and buy and hold for a full market cycle. So I'm not going to put, you know, 4.3% on there for the appreciation rate right off the bat. My sales team is not going to do that. However, when we find that you do have that mindset, you do want to invest for a full market cycle, then we're going to show you what the real potential profit centers can be, including home price appreciation, which I think I've teed you up there, Pablo. Yeah. 4.3% appreciation, press enter. You can do this yourself. If you go to jwbinventory.com, put whatever appreciation you want. You can put this last year's appreciation, which was like 20%, if you want to fantasize about that, right? You're coming in with some upside, but you put in 4.3% appreciation. It goes from 7% to 23%. Tell me why. It's uh, the magic of just sprinkling a little bit of smart debt on there, man. A little bit of smart debt. Yes, just, a pin full of smart debt, yes. Just a... Pinful, a spoonful of sugar and smart debt, you know, makes the real estate investment go round, right? <laughs> work, but I like where you're headed. Continue. Tell us why. Tell us why right. so, so what many people don't realize is when you acquire something with smart debt, smart debt meaning that it pays for itself every single month, it's low cost, like low interest rates, great terms, and it's on an asset that goes up in value over the long run. That's smart debt. When you do that, and the asset goes up in value, if you only put a percentage of your own money into it, your overall return on investment skyrockets, all right? Easy example right here. Let's just say that you own a property for, you bought it for $100,000. $100, it went up 4% in a year. Now that property is worth $104,000. Your gain is $4,000. And if you bought it in cash, your return on investment from appreciation would be 4,000 divided by 100,000 to be 4%. But if you bought that same property and sprinkled a little bit of smart debt on there, the numbers are different, right? You bought that property for 100,000, but you only put $25,000 down. You got $75,000 from the bank, all right? That value still went up 4%. So the market value of the house is now 104,000. You captured $4,000 of gains from home price appreciation, but the equation is different. It's 4,000 divided by 25,000 is your return on investment calculation from home price appreciation, which is actually a 16% return on investment, not the 4% like what you had when you bought with cash. So that 16% return on investment is huge. You couple that with the six or 7% returns from cash flow, tax savings, principal pay down, and that's how you get to that overall, call it 23 or so percent return that we're, we were just showing there on, on it. So a couple of things, right? You know, smart debt is incredible. It's an incredible asset. You got to learn how to use it. And the other thing is that think over a 10 to 20 year cycle, where's the biggest impact coming from for your return on investment? It's coming from home price appreciation. The cash flow to get you there is just like how I started this conversation. It's there to keep you in the game and to help you scale to get a number of these assets in your portfolio. It's there to keep you in the game. It's not to get you to financial freedom. It's not going to. It's going to keep you there. It's going to keep you in the game so you can hold on for a full market cycle. And when you do that, you are going to be able to accomplish your financial goals through real estate. Ah, leverage, right? Like the, the, the magical elixir that makes this asset class unparalleled, right? We talk about Without this appreciation rate, 7% with the risk profile that is much safer than the stock market and way higher than a bond makes it a really, really nice long-term investment. Sprinkle on a, a, a spoon full of sugar and a smart dip to go around, right? Like you, 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 make it, you make it a really, really special, magical Mary Poppins style investment, brings it up to this 23%. And Greg, I want to I wanna challenge you on something, right? Because you have you have opened my eyes recently to something else, right? This $110 isn't going to change your life, right? But we're talking long-term and we're talking about this appreciation, which makes it here. But at some point, you're going to pay that debt all the way down, right? If you are talking long-term, 
your cash flow from this property at some point in your retirement is going to be $845 a month. So now that at that point, you multiply that times five properties, you got this sweet cash flow going on or 10 properties, even sweeter cash flow going on. Plus you've had all this return from all the stuff and you've had the ability to borrow money based on the you know, assets that you've grown and that you've paid down and now you can leverage into other assets and now you're investing in buying homes basically for free, right? Yeah, man. Yeah. I mean, imagine, right? Pablo, you're a young guy, right? You got two JWB rental properties with us now, right? I do. All right. You're building out your portfolio. You have, you know, easily 30 years and way beyond that, hopefully forever, right? We're going to be doing this show, right? But just think about this, right? You're earning a 23% return on investment, assuming you buy and hold for a full market cycle while the debt payment is still there, right? That's why investing, especially if you have the benefit of time, investing in rental properties is amazing, right? You earn this incredible return on investment for your money while you have the debt in place. And then someday down the road, you wind up not just earning that incredible return on investment numbers wise, but that income stream is built for you. So as you go into retirement, those two houses that you have now, Pablo, maybe that's five or 10 at some point, right? Now you've got, let's say 10 houses that are producing $1,000 a month of net rental income because they were fully paid off by your resident and boom, there's your retirement plan or a portion of your retirement plan. There's how you're going to make up for social security, which is not going to be there for us, right? There's how you're going to weather the storm of rising healthcare costs, right? And, and we haven't even factored that into that 23% return on investment, right? That's just additional to your point there. So thanks, man. Thanks for pointing that out. It's really, really important. I feel like we're bringing home some stuff that we've been cooking up for a while today. And it's all kind of coming together with this spoonful of sugar, a sprinkle of debt, and, uh, you know, some deep thinking about it on early morning runs, right? <laughs> I wonder what people are thinking, like we talked about, like at five o'clock this morning, we were like, oh, we're on a big Mary Poppins kick or something. That's what we're going to bring to the theme of the show or something. I don't want to go into too deep a rabbit hole, Greg, but I'm kind of a Broadway nerd. And uh, I took my niece to see Mary Poppins like eight years ago. And if you haven't seen it, it'll blow your mind. Like I'm right. not, a, like it's a really good Broadway. All right. Anyways, I'm Prove not gonna- it. Prove it. You just had somebody call you out and said that they wanted you to sing. Jen Filson says she loves the Mary Poppins songs. Prove it. <laughs> How much of a Broadway nerd are you? Can you say? I'm not that much of a Broadway nerd. Like I like, mm-hmm. uh, I, I just did, I just did sing. I just did sing the Mary Poppins songs. Jeez, Jen. All right, man. Yeah. <laughs> careful, careful what you wish for out here. I also want to, by the way, Jen Filson, welcome to the show. The godmother of JW, JWB, not Travage Investor Show meetups. The creator of these shirts. We're glad to have you back on the show, Jen. And Jen is announcing right now she is on her way to Chicago for a conference coming in soon. So if you're in Chicago, you want to hang out with other like-minded investors, Jen and Renee are flying to your town. Hit her up. Go to the Facebook group. Talk to her or talk to her here on the chat. She's always real, real, real present. And our Facebook group is at jwbfacebookgroup.com. And something else that at jwbfacebookgroup.com. I'm just going to repeat that because it's the cool club. I want you in here if you're not. And another thing that I want to call out, right? This idea that we've been thinking and packaging and, and expressing ways to, to express ourselves. I think this asset management stuff is really ringing true, right? Leo chimes in. That's what's outstanding about JWB. Complete turnkey solution plus the asset management, as GC explains. Love it. I think, I think our... Our fellow Not Your Average Investor Show families that have invested with JWB it are do understand this idea of it's not property management, it's asset management, man. So I think we found some some gold and some messaging out here. That's the beauty of what we what we do here in the community. I mean, you guys help us kind of refine our message. I mean, you guys can see how this has kind of been refined, even for those who have been following the show for a long time, right? The fact of how we relay what's really important for cash flow and total return on investment and how to think about home price appreciation. Go back and look at the first shows that we did <laughs> and you could see me stumbling all over myself and see, you know, what we, what we have now. You guys are such a big part of making this better and better. So thank you. Yeah, man. I mean, I don't think you said vertical integration for nine months on this show and now you don't shut up about it. So that is all it's, it's, it is crowdsourced knowledge. This is, this was the plan, right? When we started this community, when we started the show is to really understand from your viewpoint, how you think about what is happening, what you need. So we really, really love the feedback and the Facebook group interaction. Would love to hear in the Facebook group or on the show, any ideas to make this better, especially by the way, I know as somebody that's obsessive with community, 
there's always lurkers in a community, right? Like really only about 20% of the people engaged, 80% are this term called lurkers, which I think is a funny term. I don't think it's a bad term, but we love our lurkers, right? Like we love, so, so folks, you know, if you're showing up and you come to, you know, three or four calls a month or one call a month and you don't say much, I love you. Thank you so much. I would love to hear, I would love to hear from you how we can make it better, right? Like I would love to hear that stuff. So speaking of things that are important, before I go too far down a rabbit hole of telling everybody how much I freaking love this community and how special it all is, this house is close to a big, big job provider. We teased it in the beginning of the show. Tell us about that, GC. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, why don't we, I don't know if you want me to bring up the map, but I think it'd be cool to show just how close this, this property is and, and give a little bit of love to this neighborhood. You know, it might be better for me to show it because I've got the map of all the JWB properties, unless you got that handy there, Pablo. I don't have a hand. Yeah. I don't have a hand. Yeah. All right, well, and I, just, yeah. I just want to call out Lee Bishop in the chat. He says, I think the show has surely matured since inception. I would, I would say, yes, Lee, the show has matured and I think Greg and I have gone immature in <laughs> what we talk about. We're out here sitting these days. Very right, true. You, you're going to show the map? You're gonna show yeah, something? I'll show the map here. So let me go ahead and do the share screens thing. Boom, boom, boom. All right. So anytime that you are sitting down with our team to be able to buy a property, whether you're a current client or you're a new client coming, coming through, we're always going to try to sit down with you and talk about goals, expectations and all that good stuff. Right before property selection, we're going to send you a, a curated list of recommended properties that are available that hit all of those metrics. And we're going to take a look at it on the map. And it just gives great confidence to the new investor, especially who might not have bought a property with JWB or with anybody in general about how we're not doing something new here. We're tying into a system and a model that is time tested and proven. And the best way to show that is just to take a look at the map of Jacksonville, like we see right here, and take a look at all of these other properties that are these blue dots, as I'm sorry, I'm moving around so much here, but you can see here, all these blue dots around Jacksonville, there's over 2000 properties that have been purchased by other JWB clients. And they are literally right next to this house on McLaughlin Street that we're profiling here, right? So let me kind of zoom in there. You can see this is the west side of Jacksonville. This is one of our four key neighborhoods. The other ones are the north side up here. This is Arlington over here, and this is the south side. But you can see we are highly focused on being in the same neighborhoods. This house on McLaughlin is on the west side. Again, just absolutely dominated by JWB. These have been the same neighborhoods that I've been investing in since 2006. But just look at how many properties we've built or renovated I mean, it doesn't even get a credit when you start to think about some of these properties here that we built out, right? This is a townhome community that we built out, right? There's probably 50 or 100 properties within a mile radius. And so that's really important for this house that's going to be purchased by a JWB client here, this one on McLaughlin that we're profiling, because we know exactly what your rents are going to be. We know exactly what your property tax is, insurance, right? We know all of these either income producers or costs. We know about the water treatment fees that we're going to incur on the property. Well, this is how we do that. There's not other, another property management company that has this much knowledge and experience specifically in a neighborhood like this, and that's going to play to your benefit. One of the other reasons why this property is going to be a great investment for somebody is the proximity to job creators. And I love profiling our properties of the week because it gives me an opportunity to profile the big job creators, which at the end, at the end of the day, we need to have a solid, you know, a, a, a lot of job creators, right? You can't just be one job creator for a neighborhood. And I was trying to think of a, a name of job creators, a, a, a gaggle of, of job creators. That's what came to my head. So you need to have a gaggle of job creation, cornucopia of job creators. Well, one of the biggest job creators in all of Jacksonville is our military presence. And this is Jacksonville Naval Air Station right here, which we call NAS Jax. You can see here, I don't know, what, five miles or so from this property on McLaughlin. Again, a huge reason why we choose to invest here on the west side is because of the proximity to NAS Jax, as well as the proximity to downtown Jacksonville, which is right over here and has 50, 55,000 jobs. But let's talk a little bit about NAS Jax right here. So I went and I just pulled some of the numbers here. So you got over 10,000 total active duty servicemen and women, 34,000 family members, 
8,300 federal employees, 2,500 contract employees, 1,000 transient personnel, all revolving around this base. And at the end of the day, it brings 21,000 jobs to the economy. Do you want to be in a place where it has, it, do you want to own an investment where there are 21,000 jobs? Of course you do, because those people who live there and work there and live on base and off base, they want to be close to that local, that, that part of the gaggle of <laughs> job creators, right? So Smorgas when you're thinking of, of job creators. Cornucopia, sorry, cornucopia, right? What's, or or what's smorgasbord. You know, I'm, I'm a involved. <laughs> right, right, write that down. Smorgasbord, job, job <laughs> creators, right? So these are the things to look for when you're making your decision of where to invest, right? You're going to make your decision, of course, on the overall market, the team, right? But then look at what job creators are within driving distance of your local, uh, of that specific neighborhood. You're not going to find many more neighborhoods that have more job creators than here, West Side, Jacksonville. And again, that's why we choose parts of the North Side to invest in. I can come up with those job creators up there, Arlington and South Side as well. But yeah, wanted to show a little bit of love to NAS Jackson, our service men and women. We love the military and we love serving those folks for their housing needs. Amen, man. Amen to that. You want to stop sharing your screen? There, just- I do. When you say when you say smorgasbord cornucopia of job creators, I think low vacancy rates, right? If you're really going to simplify that from the mindset of an investor. All right, we got a question here from Miguel Angel Sanudo. He asks, "Welcome back, Miguel Angel. I feel like we haven't heard you chiming in very much for a while. I know you're in Spain, so it's got to be tough, right? So we love the fact that you're you're joining in here." He asks, "What, in your opinion, are the main drawbacks when investing in real estate?" And he lists a couple of things, inflation, increased cost of services, home insurance prices, major renovations, require eviction, property taxes, hurricanes. What do you think of the drawbacks, GC? You know, the biggest drawback for investors out there, and it was the toughest thing for me in the beginning, was an alignment of goals. You, you need a team to be able to accomplish your goals in rental property investing whether or not you're working with JWB or whether or not you're doing this, what you think is on your own, you still need a team, right? You need your, your team of, you know, your realtor, whoever's going to help you acquire it. You need your contractor team. You need your closing team. You need an insurance team, right? You need your handyman and your, your, your vendor base or else it's not going to work and the the work's going to fall on you and it's not going to be a passive investment and it's not, you're just not going to like it. So I think the biggest drawback is, the amount of coordinated effort that needs to be done in order for this to be successful. And I go back to a stat that this is, this is from a, oh my goodness, what's the name of the survey company that ever, that everybody, man, it's like the most, yeah, I don't know. I'll come up with it. (laughs) It's like the most respected surveys out there. They reference them and I'm just having a brain lapse at the moment. Anyway, so it surveyed investors out there and they asked them, what was the best long-term investment investment for, for you as an investor? And the vast majority, the number one answer, the majority of folks out there said real estate was the best long-term investment for them. It beats stocks, bonds, CDs, gold, and real estate was the answer. And then they asked those same people, how many of you have real estate in your portfolio And it wasn't the number one answer, the number two answer, the number three answer, or the number four answer. It was the fifth most popular actual investment for folks. And to me, what that communicated is it's hard. It's hard to invest in real estate. So if I'm going back to when I made the decisions to jump both feet in into into real estate, I I just realized that this was not going to be as simple, as easy as as, uh, investing in the stock market. Those other things that you asked about, I, I, I... I mean, going down the line, I heard inflation. I think inflation, real estate investing is your friend when it comes to inflation. Owning hard assets is your friend. It's a hedge against inflation. So I think that's a, a real positive. You know, hurricanes, you know, you could make the argument that hurricanes, of course, are, are, are terrible when you have a hard asset like, like a rental property. Being in Florida, it's hurricane season right now. We hear about it often. I can tell you I own over 300 rental properties and I sleep really well at night even when storms are coming. And it's because of insurance, you know, insurance helps me sleep well at night. Insurance protects you about catastrophic loss for hurricanes. I will tell you though, there's the, the only thing that worries me when it comes to hurricanes is our residents and how to take care of our residents and to make sure that our owners have those things that need to be done taken care of. So those things of course, keep me up late at night, but that's why we're here. That's, that's why we're here as your property manager. So 
I don't know. And, you, and you see, when you say all that, right? Like, yeah, it kind of, to me, the word that pops up or the phrase that pops up is that real estate really takes a village. And if we're going to, if we're going to use that example, right. That, and that's, that's the drawback, right? You need a lot of people, which every person that is involved with anything, for whether it be it a resident or a partner that you need or a, or, or a team that you need, that's, that's a variable, right? But when you are vertically integrated in a specific fashion with a proper strategy to provide that village, now you look at hurricanes and you think you sleep well at night because of insurance and because we saw that population of homes. We saw the, the amount of homes that you're building. We've talked about it on the show, how you guys, you guys cut about 4 million bucks worth of checks. I think the number, I always change the number, but you guys cut multiple million dollars worth of checks to construction companies every single month because you have such a large um, footprint that requires that team and requires that village. So you're constantly nurturing that village. You have a flywheel that feeds that village. So you sleep well at night during hurricanes because not only do you have insurance, but you also have the people on the ground that you're doing business with all the time that are the ones that are going to take your call during an emergency because you are the biggest purchaser in town as well, right? So, you know, it takes a village and the JWB kind of strategy, which is what I really echo with because I'm a big community guy, has been to nurture the village in a way to align incentives all with each other. So, you know, I, I think you I think you identified the biggest pain point of why people don't do it. And you also identified why people actually do it with JWB and why we have 29 people that show up on a, on a Thursday and, and 20 of them are clients that have been super happy and just show up because they, they like you and they like everything that they've been working with all the time. Right. So I think that's really interesting. And speaking of clients, I bring a lot of value. Jen fills in Nielsen's Nielsen's. Nielsen's. There you go. <laughs> Thank you, man. You know, we're going over GC and I know that we're trying to stick to stick to stick to the program, but I think we talk about this like crowd, generated concept and i want to give a little bit of love erin o'neill came up with a really good thing that's going on and i think she's here so i, I would love to kind of ad address what what the what the topic was right because we do want to encourage bring up bring up topics that you care about we're going to talk about them on the show tell me about it gc erin amazing client super good friend my, my favorite uh new england patriots fan and I don't know if she knows what, what an accomplishment that is, because I didn't even think I would ever say that, but she's my favorite New England Patriots fan out there. <laughs> she, she sent a message through Facebook and sent along a really great uh, article. And the article was highlighting how the Biden administration has set aside funds and, and is, is planning to make 100,000 affordable homes overall for the country, as well as restri limiting restrictions on zoning and making it easier to build houses. And she said, well, what does this mean? What does this mean for pricing? And so I, I thought it was a wonderful question. I thought we'd answer it on the, uh, or on the call here because I'm sure others have, have heard this. Well, the, the reality is that for, and I'll post this article in the group after this. So Aaron, thank you so much for, for, for sending this. The reality is that this 100,000 homes that the Biden administration is, is trying to come up with through these measures is a great start, but it is a drop in the bucket for the supply problem, the supply challenge that we have in the real estate uh, market nationally. The National Association of Realtors released a report that says we are undersupplied by 6.8 million homes in the U.S. And if you want to understand why prices have gone up 15 to 20 percent over the last year, the biggest reason is because of a lack of supply. We had 8,000 homes on the market a year and a half ago. Right now, we have 3,500 homes on the market. There's just not inventory out there. And this is the reason why home prices will continue to go up, especially in the short run. So when we're thinking about 100,000 homes, it is a small drop in the bucket. I don't want to diminish it. I love that the Biden administration is thinking about this. It needs to come in the form of re reduced restrictions on builders so that they can build more homes so they can get the balance of supply and demand back in line. And also in, you know, investing in technologies, right? Investing in ways to be able to build homes and, you know, in a different way, the construction industry hasn't been disrupted in a hundred years. So that, that disruption is making its way. We've seen 3D printed homes, right? 
JWB built a, an apartment complex out of shipping containers to try to come up with a, affordable strategies to build homes and create affordable housing. And I think it's going to be whatever the government can do to make that more of a reality. And they do have an influence, a big influence on that. So I think that's really going to, to help. For us as investors, this the, the predicament that the country is in as far as lack of supply is, is going to help us profit handsomely. I mean, that's just the reality, right? For those of you who own hard assets, if there's a lack of supply, that means that prices are going to go up until supply and demand become more normalized. And it's just not going to happen over the next year. So for all of you who have owned houses, for those of you who were listening a year and a half ago when the pandemic said started and we said the best thing you can do is to buy rental properties at that time, you are in a wonderful position. You know, this news really isn't going to change it one way or the other. Home prices are going to go up over the next year. And then eventually they'll, they'll, we'll, we'll get back to equilibrium at some point. And equilibrium would be normal appreciation is what you would expect at, you know, 4.3%. 4 so Aaron, thank you so much for the question. Hopefully that gave you the answer you're looking for. Yes, Aaron. And we have gone over in time. We try to stick to 1.30. We have a question from Luis Vieira in the chat. Luis, We'll have, we'll have the team reach out to you to answer that. It's about multifamily investing opportunities. We've addressed it multiple times on the show in the past, but I encourage you to join the Facebook group, Ask It and Dare. You're going to get a great crowdsource answers because you're going to see where multifamily fits into the equation here in Jacksonville. Do you see? Great show today, buddy. I want to encourage everybody that you know came here to learn about rental property investing. I hope, hope that filled your bucket some. Anybody that came here to learn about uh, rental, pro rental property management, right? Property management. We talked about it. It's asset management, baby, right? You learned about that today. And those of you that came for an edge in the real estate market in Jacksonville, we gave up a lot of new stats, right? Hope that that added a feather to your cap to some new opportunities. If you want to find out about more opportunities in any of that stuff, go to chatwithjwb.com, hop on a call with the team and really start to contextualize it to whatever your pain point or whatever your question is. Build a plan for yourself. We said at the beginning of the show, next week, we got the CEO of the city, the the CEO of the Chamber of Commerce here, Daniel Davis. He was one of our original guests on the Notch Average Investor Show. Cool guy, smart guy, really heady guy with great information. Please join us. We'd love to see you there. And I just want to thank everybody for coming. It is, it is never, never lost on me that you take out a, an hour of your day in the middle of a work week to hang out with us. And uh, really, really makes me super duper happy. GC, I'll give you last words. I'm super duper happy as well. Thank you all for being here. It means a lot to Pablo and myself. Super excited to have Daniel Davis on the show with us next Tuesday. You all have been asking for those high profile guests in Jacksonville and those who are really on the inside, who are making decisions that are affecting downtown, that are affecting the overall economy here in Jacksonville. Well, you're going to get to talk to the CEO and the president of the Jacksonville Chamber of Commerce. Not too many other people who have that type of ability here in Jacksonville. So I hope you all Take, take us up on that that opportunity. Take advantage of it. Daniel is a, an incredible guy. We have a great relationship, and we're super happy to welcome him back to the show. And we're happy to welcome all of you. If you're a new person joining the show, thank you for being here. And for all of the veterans here in the Not Your Average Investor Show community, we love you, and we'll see you next Tuesday. Thank you, everybody.